Mary Smith is committed to improving the patient's experience in vascular access and has been a leading voice in vascular access education for over 20 years. She started and managed a vascular access team at her local hospital in Wisconsin that went, get this, 14 years without eclabsy. She then founded CVC Healthcare in 2012 after several years of observing poor practice and identifying the need to educate all who insert and care for devices. Mary speaks locally, regionally, and internationally on topics related to best practice. CVC Healthcare has become the largest independent provider of vascular access education in the world. So we are so grateful to have her here with us today. Please join me in welcoming our Wednesday workshop presenter, Mary Smith. Great, thank you, Matt. Um, thank you for that kind introduction. Um, I'm, a, I'm honored to be here and doing the Midline Catheter sessions for the next three Wednesdays. Um, as Matt said, I'm a vascular access nurse from Wisconsin. I live between Madison and Milwaukee, kind of rural Wisconsin. And vascular access has been my passion for many, many years. Um, CBC Healthcare travels, we teach. I have a team of experts, um, nurses, uh, respiratory therapists, PAs, physicians. We teach all multiple discipline, all disciplines on all devices, insertion, care, maintenance, removal. Um, I have to give a big shout out and thank you to all the researchers who do all the research for me and my company. We read your articles, we utilize your information, everything that we teach is evidence based, and we um, really want to improve practice and we want to present best practice to um, to our, our attendees and students who take our classes. So thank you, Aliquis, for supporting me, and um, I'm really excited um, to start the presentation. So during the presentation, Matt's going to be moving my slide for me. If you hear me say, okay, Matt, it's because rural Wisconsin sometimes gets in a little trouble <laughs> with Wi-Fi, so we're hoping not. Um, but um, all right, great. Thank you, Matt. So the description. So midline catheters are an appropriate venous access device, option for patients expecting prolonged IV therapy as well as those with challenging vascular anatomy due to age or medical history. Considered a multifaceted device, midlines offer the potential for reduced complication rates. And we're gonna talk about complication rates. We're gonna a little bit today. We're gonna to spend a lot of time on week two talking about that. So please come back for week two. Um, but while not entirely new, dynamics in healthcare fuel the recent research, uh, resurgence in the utilization. We're gonna talk about why are we seeing more midlines being ordered? Why are we seeing more midlines being used? And are we using them appropriately? So we really wanna um, discuss that today. So this series will receive the history, current practice, and new innovations in midline catheter technology. Okay. So the objectives, review the history and evolution of midline catheters driven by industry, describe the indication, benefits, and risks surrounding the use of midline catheters, dispel myths and misinformation related to proper use of midline catheters. And we're seeing a huge increase in use of midline catheters without the knowledge to go behind that, uh, to back up why are we putting that line in, what is that line, where's the tip. Um, so we just really need to dispel that and really um, all come onto the same and be on the same page in regards to midline catheters and what are their uses for. So we're going to review new catheter technology designed to reduce, reduce excuse me, failure rates and improve cl clinical outcomes. And that's going to be in week three. So you're going to have to come through all the way, all the way to uh, week three to get all the information objectives covered. So thank you, Matt. So poll question, we want to poll the audience here. Um, so which of the following describes the current state of midline catheter utilization at your facility or practice? So the first one is incorporated into the device selection process now. So you have somebody who decides to choose that device. Um, minimal use, we don't, you know, we use midlines here or there. We don't use midlines at all. And I'm really not sure um, who does the, who, um, the current state of midline catheters at our facility. Oh, very, very good, excellent. So 60% of you already incorporated the device into the selection process now, and that's great. Um, minimal use, not at all. These are um, these are numbers that I would have expected um, after traveling across the country and talking with other uh, facilities, um, nurses, respiratory therapists, physicians, PAs, all the people that place these devices, um, these numbers kind of correspond with that, these percentiles. So very good, I'm happy to see 59%. Thank you, Matt. All right, so session one, the history of midline catheters. So midlines have been around um, and, and in use since 1950. Midlines evolved from the need of a device that can remain in for many days. When I think about 
um, evolving a, or creating a device that can remain in for many days. I think, you know, the peripheral IV, right? Midline is a peripheral catheter, but we weren't getting success with our peripheral catheter. So industry has created a midline catheter for us um, because we are having difficulty with our short peripheral catheters. Um, they were placed by physicians first, and then in the 1960s by nurses. Um, and then now we have nurses, we have respiratory therapists, we have PAs, we have physicians placing um, midline catheters. So midline is derived from the mid-arm location, meaning that the catheter is in the mid-arm. So definition of a midline catheter. A midline catheter is a long peripheral catheter. It's a peripheral catheter. We have short peripheral catheters, we have long peripheral catheters, and it's placed in the upper arm veins to administer certain types of medications. Okay. So a little bit about me and my experience. Um, so I started putting midline catheters in 1997. I was an oncology uh, chemotherapy nurse, and I put a lot of short peripheral catheters, a little 20 gauge, um, little 22 gauge um, angels for those very difficult access patients. And a sales rep came into my um, came into the chemotherapy suite and said, "Do you want to learn to put a midline in and a pick line?" And I had no idea what he was talking about. Of course, I said sure because I I love to learn new things. Um, but back then, in 1997, when we were inserting midline catheters. We used large bore needles, we used 14, 16 gauge peripheral IVs. We stuck the patient blinded. Um, we palpated, hopefully we were getting the epicelic vein and not the artery near it. Um, no ultrasound, we were blind sticking, and then we fed that catheter through that large peripheral IV catheter. Um, a lot of the midlines back then were placed after, uh, because of failed peripheral IV attempts. Um, so I think about putting these midline catheters and I think about, I think I had, I, I know I had gloves on and I think I had a mask on, um, but think I think how things have evolved and what the evidence tells us we should be doing today. Um, I guess one thing I can say to that 1997 midline catheters, I used lidocaine, right? I did use lidocaine. So I feel like I did a good thing for the patient there, but think of the trauma that we caused to the vessel. Think of the putting that catheter in the uh, area of function, which we no longer um, are doing. We have to get those catheters out. We have to prevent some of these um, complications that occur. But that's my experience. My first midline was 1997. And I thought I did a good job. So next. Thank you. So this is a midline catheter. Um, when I see this picture, the first thing that I, I think about is like, hmm, it looks like a pick line catheter. It looks like a midline, it looks like a pick line. Um, midline catheters, we're gonna talk a little bit more about them, but where that tip location and why that really does matter. Um, okay, thanks, Matt. So midline catheters, indications for you. So use a midline catheter for medications and solutions such as antimicrobials, fluid replacement, analgesics <clears throat> with characteristics that are well tolerated by peripheral veins. So you just have to remember, just because a catheter is up here, this is the insertion side of peripheral vein, the tip of our catheter is still peripheral. It's a peripheral catheter, long peripheral catheter, um, midline catheter. Um, dwell times on our midline catheters. We used to do 29 days. The instructions for you, so I said 29 days on midline catheters. We no longer do that. Dwell times, we are clinically indicated. We leave our midline catheters in um, until end of therapy or there's a complication. So that really warrants eyes on the arm. That really warrants our assessment at the bedside. It warrants teaching for anybody who's teaching nurses and uh, healthcare providers how to put midline catheters in. Um, if we're gonna leave them in to clinically indicated, we have to have our eyes on them. And we have to touch the patient, we have to ask the patient. Um, so consider using an, um, an antimicrobial midline. This is in the standards of uh, the standards of practice 2021. Consider using an antimicrobial midline catheter for patients at risk of developing a catheter-associated bloodstream infection. And we're gonna talk about that in, in um, the session three about different types of catheter material that are out on the market now. And, um, can, will they be a game changer? How can they help us with our practice? Will they prevent complications related to these um, midline catheters? We'll talk further about that. But basically, anything you infuse in a peripheral IV, you can infuse in a midline catheter, just longer um, longer dwell times. We had a patient on vancomycin, and I know this is gonna get some questions, but we diluted our vanco out and we did six weeks on a midline catheter. And the patient did just fine. But with the assessment and part of the process was um, we were on it. And we were very educated and knowledgeable about what to be watching for. So assess the infusive characteristic in conjunction with an anticipated duration of treatment, about well, five days up to 14 days, but may last longer. I think the longest midline I had was six weeks and it did fine. Okay. So midline insertion location. So midlines are inserted 
<clears throat> midline catheter insert in veins in the upper arm, basilic, cephalic, or brachial veins. So I'm a uh, PIC nurse, and we don't call ourselves PIC nurses anymore. I just said that because 1997, that's what we used to call us, right? Some of us are nurse, nurses, um, and we were used to putting devices um, in those veins um, under MST technique. Um, but new people really kind of struggle with that, but we really need to have that location. We need to have those catheters in the upper arm, basilic, cephalic, or brachial. So the internal tip located at or just distal to the level of the axilla region um, in children and adults. So we can insert these catheters for neonate midlines can be placed via the scalp vein um, <clears throat> with the tip, distal tip located in the jugular vein above the clavicle or below the inguinal crease if placed in the lower extremity. Okay. So tip location. Tip location matters. It does matter. Where are short peripheral catheters? When, when I'm talking with people and they're calling me or we're consulting about medications or infusates or symptoms, redness, swelling, or pain, I'm like, where's the tip of your catheter? It just gets them thinking. Where, where is the tip? It does matter. When you take a look at this midline catheter, the tip of the catheter is at the axillary region. External catheter looks like a pick line to me. Um, there are some midlines that don't look like pick lines, um, but this is the midline that I used to, a 20 centimeter trimmable midline. Um, but it's really about where is the tip of the catheter. So the pick line um, is a peripherally inserted catheter, but the tip is central. So when we're doing education and talking with colleagues, it's like it's really about where is the tip of that catheter, because that tells me uh, a lot of information that I can start to consult with and work with other, um, but if there's any issues with the patient at all. So the pick is a peripherally inserted central catheter, and the tip resides um, the lower third of the SVC at the capal atrial junction. Huge difference in what medications you can and cannot infuse in those areas. Okay. So cautions and risks. So we're going to talk a lot about this in the next two weeks too as well, but I really just wanted to talk about this a little bit today because we are seeing a lot of midline catheters being ordered to reduce as a CLABSI reduction strategy. And for those of you who don't know CLABSI, central line associated bloodstream infection, right? Those numbers are... At COVID, post-COVID, we're right back to where we were pre-COVID. We were making such great strides in reducing clads, and now we're right back up um, to where we were uh, pre-COVID. So we're starting to see more midlines because people, you know, hospitals don't want to report those um, clabsies, but guess what? We have to report hospital acquired infections and we have to report catheter associated bloodstream infections. So we still have to report them, but they are not a device used that should be used to reduce uh, the strategy to reduce um, clabsies. They are a peripheral device. They are not a central line. Um, and what is ordered, if the medication is ordered that needs a central line, we need a central line. So we are seeing an increase in midline use to prevent associated bloodstream infections. Um, guess what? They can get infected too. Um, so avoid the use of midline catheter when the patient has a history of thrombosis, hypercoagulability, decreased venous flow to the extremities or end-stage renal disease requiring vein preservation. So it's really important that we assess the patient, but we also assess the chart. What is the patient's past medical history when we're doing device selection? So I was really glad that 59% of you have that in your practice already that are saying that <clears throat> I'm assessing the patient, I'm assessing uh, the chart, and then the prescribed therapy, and then I'm deciding whether the, the midline catheter is appropriate device or not. So great. Okay. So cautions and risk continues. We do not use midline catheters for continuous subsequent therapy. TPN or infusates with extremes of pH or osmolarity greater than 900 milliosmoles. So we know the standards of practice took the pH out um, between five and nine, um, but I've been doing this for a long time. So I really kind of still do pay a little bit of attention to that. I mean, I want to know um, the pH and osmolarity of drugs, osmolarity for sure, but pH, all of my uh, catheters that I place, every device, I'm looking at the therapy and I'm looking at the pH and osmolarity. So consider increased catheter site surveillance with intermittent administration of known irritants and vesicants due to increased risk of phlebitis or extravasation. So vancomycin is the big one, and this is the one that everybody asks me as, as, as we travel. A lot of questions come around midline catheters, and we are administering vancomycin in our midline catheter. We have um, high-level, um, skilled, knowledgeable nurses taking care of the patient with the midline catheter with the tip at the, below the axillary region with vancomycin running. Um, and just ask yourself, and you can, we'll talk a little bit about this, and I'm sure there will be a question on it. And are you administering um, vancomycin in your midline catheter? And if you are, are you seeing any problems? And data is really important that we collect data and um, kind of see where we're at and what progress or what uh, who we need to improve on. Okay. 
All right, reducing complications for midline. So we're going to talk a lot um, the next two weeks too about infiltration, um, extravasation, dislodgement, um, occlusion. But today, you know, catheter-associated <clears throat> DVTs, right? Assess before you place. So midline catheters, even way back in the day, was this was a complication that was associated with midline catheters. And we used to think was because we put them in the areas of flexion, right? We put that midline catheter in the bottom of the arm, and every time the patient moved their arm, that catheter moved in and out. Um, we didn't do catheter vein ratio. We didn't look at the size of the vein. Can it accommodate this catheter? We didn't do that back then. So we still had high DVT rates with those way back in the day. And then we kind of went away from midline catheters and now we're seeing a resurgence of midline catheters um, because of, um, of the uh, central and social bloodstream infections. They are a great device and they need to be in our toolbox um, and we need to be using the midline catheters for certain things. But we also need to know the complications that can occur with midline pla catheter placed if we are, are not uh, following and monitoring those devices. So identify risk factors for the um, you know, catheter-associated DVTs, uh, catheter-associated deep vein thrombosis. Look at the patient's medical history. Look at the catheter vein ratio. If you've never, if you have an ultrasound and you put it on a patient and you're not sure how to use the calipers or how to measure, you know, get somebody in there to help you with that. Most of the vascular access team or vascular access specialist nurses or best vascular access specialist teams, RTs, who's ever working on our teams, knows how to do a catheter vein ratio. We need to look at the vein, can it accommodate the gauge of the catheter, the size of the catheter? Um, we want a catheter to vein ratio is about 45%, less than 45% of that catheter taken up that vein purchase. Um, so use the appropriate catheter gauge. That's been a standard forever, right? The, the smallest gauge, small, uh, um, uh, least amount of lumens to accommodate prescribed therapy. So we have to know the prescribed therapy. Um, and the most common, this is the only one we place in our facilities a for a French single lumen. If I need two lumens, if I need a larger gauge, um, then I'm looking at a different type of catheter for the patient. Especially if I need more than one lumen, I'm probably going to be putting a pick in. Just depends on the um, prescribed therapy. That's the first thing in the patient's vascular history. So, okay. So poll question number two, let's poll the audience again. Um, you guys are great on that first question. So how do you determine the appropriate length of midline catheter place? Um, select one of the following. So <clears throat> we have many different lengths available and we do not measure. Uh, we measure from insertion site to just below the axial region. And this is kind of cut off. So an insertion site to below the axial region. Um, and then we have, or we have a one size that fits all and, or I'm not really sure how this is, how this is done. So we have many different lengths available and do not measure 4%. Um, measure from the insertion site to just full actually, yay, yay, I like to hear that. Um, that's a huge number, that's great. We have one size that fits all and not really sure how this is done. So these, this, these are pretty typical results too that we see when you, it correlates to that, you know, 60% um, vascular access team who decides on the device to be um, inserted for the patient. Um, so that, that fits that, those numbers, so great, thank you. All right, so looking back, I know the 20 minute um, presentation today and um, thank you all for attending again, but looking back at, you know, Midland Catholic, they've been here for years. We've had these devices in our hands for years. We've had opportunities to use them, but we just didn't have the knowledge and we didn't have the research and we didn't have the education regarding to Midland catheters. Um, they were only placed by physicians uh, until around 1960. They were placed in the bend of the arm, the AC fossa, lots of issues with that. We know now we can't be putting devices in, the, in areas of flexion. Uh, we didn't use ultrasound, we were blind sticking, we're no longer doing that. Um, I'm hoping to see a re you know, reduction in midline catheter, not a reduction, but uh, uh, like an opportunity to put the midline catheter, but it actually really is a short peripheral catheter, the appropriate device, and if it is, do we have ultrasound? Is that why we're going to some of the midlines? And I know sometimes we go to the pick line for difficult access or are, are unable to get the midline cat or short peripheral catheter in. Um, we didn't have vascular access team, we were pick nurses, um, but we know that um, has evolved and changed over the years, which is a wonderful thing. And then use when we couldn't get the peripheral IV in. So, okay. So that puts us right about the uh, 20, um, 20 minute mark. And um, just remember there's a downloadable. So each session, each week that we do this, there'll be a downloadable that you can take with you. Um, when do I order mid midline catheter? And again, we just put consider, consider 
ordering when. So these are not absolute. Again, the patient assessment is really important. Prescribed therapy is important. And patient's ask for help is important before we decide. Um, there are three things, though, do not. Um, we should not be ordering a, a midline catheter for, and they are listed for you. So there's the instructions to down that um, deliverable and take that with you. And um, question time. The first question we have, um, do you have any evidence on pediatric midline dwell times and lab draws? Sure. Um, so midline um, for pediatric, uh, neonate. <clears throat> so when we're looking at dwell times for these catheters, um, Hopefully you're clinically indicated on these pediatric and neonate. We're not routinely changing these catheters out. Um, lab draws are, are a very interesting thing with midline catheters because midline catheters are short, they're long, excuse me, they're long peripheral catheter. And do we always get a blood return off our long peripheral catheters? Uh, no, not most often. Um, but we still are assessing. Um, is it infusing okay? Is there any redness, swelling, or pain? Does it hurt? If there's no symptoms, we still continue to use the midline catheter for infusations. But again, we're not giving chemo to any of those midline catheters, so we just have to keep your eye on them. Okay. Great. Thank you, Mary. Uh, here's here's a question for you. The only hesitation I have for inserting a pick over a midline is ability to draw blood. I would put a pick if there's a likelihood of frequent blood draws. What do you advise? Well, if there's a likelihood of frequent blood draws, we do not play central lines for likelihood of, of, of uh, frequent blood draws because of the incidence of uh, catheter-associated bloodstream infections, because there is evidence to support increase in clavies when we have an increase in blood draws off our central lines. Um, yeah, I, I don't like to stick the patient. Um, I don't for frequent blood draws, but what is frequent and what does it look like and what does their vascular health look like? Do they have uh, veins there that are suitable for me to do that with? It's really a, the assessment process and it's really a collaborative decision with the patient, the physician and yourself as the inserter to um, come up with what is the best plan for this patient. Um, central lines, um, if, you know, they, they have their own complications too as well. It's most of the same as a midline catheter. Um, so we just need to be, assessing and looking at the whole process for the patient um, uh, well-being and evidence-based practice. Okay. okay, thank you, Mary. I think mm -hmm. we've got time for one more question and okay. there were quite a lot of questions um, about babies, neonates, you know, yeah. pediatric patients. Yeah. So, so here, here's one of those. Um, it is, can you place midlines in the saphenous in babies? Well, you know, I, I was hoping maybe some of my couple of my, um, I'm an adult nurse, to be honest with you, and I've never put a, a midline in a baby, um, but I did reach out to Holly Haas, and I know Connie Durantini is available, so those, that is something I would get back to you. The standards of practice don't say this happened in Spain, um, but I'd have to do some more research for you on that, because I've never put a, a midline in a baby, so. I'm adult nurse for many reasons, um, and you adult, you baby nurses, I, I give you, I applaud you. You're amazing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm so glad you're here, <laughs> and I'm so glad you're working with us. So great. Yeah, but we will find out. I will find out for you, and we'll get that information to you. Excellent. Thank you, Mary. Well, that does bring us to our conclusion here. So again, thank you, Mary. On behalf of all of us at Eloquest Healthcare, I'd like to thank you all for attending this Wednesday workshop webinar, the first in the three-part series.